So let's start out by talking about Robert Moses, who's a figure who in his day was lionized, and since Robert Caro's remarkable, uh, but perhaps slightly one-sided biography, The Power Broker, has been demonized. Where did he come from? What sparked him on this remarkable career of, of rebuilding the city? Moses was schooled in a belief that serving the public interest was a nonpartisan task. And he believed in meritocratic bureaucracy, a political meritocratic bureaucracy. And I think that early uh, formative view of things was something that he brought into his work in ensuing decades and made it very difficult for people to comprehend how it is that he could position himself above the political process defining the public good. And how does he get his start? He begins actually writing about the nature of government and then gradually works his way into, into the political firmament. He does, and the most significant experience in that before he came to New York City was working for Governor Al Smith, where he developed a program of parks that really was what launched his career and attracted the attention of Fiorello LaGuardia, who appointed Moses as the park commissioner day one of his service as mayor, because the alluring uh, attraction of Moses virtually to every politician was that he accomplished building projects, which led to bin cuttings and a variety of benefits in communities. So politicians like this man, despite his various shortcomings and the different challenges he presented in, in managing him, but he produced projects that they could champion. And then in the New Deal, he starts doing more and more stuff with the connection to LaGuardia, and I guess also the connection to Washington, D.C. as well, right? And what, what are the projects? Schools, roads? In the 30s, he continues building parkways, but now in New York City. He builds pools. He builds playgrounds. He builds beaches. It was a remarkable period of construction, which was made possible primarily by the availability of New Deal funding, of federal funding. Absolutely. But there must have also been something that slightly differs with the modern era, because he seems to have been able to just cite things wherever he wanted to, whereas we know any time you try to do a, a modern project, you've got 4,000 community activists who are saying no to whatever you're doing. So clearly it was a, a different era politically. A, d a different era in countless ways. There, there wasn't an, an environmental review process. There weren't the myriad review stages. And he was also a bully. And one of the useful ways he used his bullying behavior as a tool was to sort of overcome the resistance of other city agencies that felt some stake in something. So often he would be doing something where the sanitation department, the tra transportation department, and others, as well as parks, would feel they had some vested interest. And his view was, this is my project. I'm getting it done. You'll just follow along. And that the kind of anger that produced didn't bother him at all. What he cared about was completing the project. Now, one of the most controversial things that he did after the war was running a highway through the Bronx, right, which is where the, the, some, of the, some of the early opposition starts to, to coalesce. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? It, particularly, there's a, there's a famous neighborhood that it ran through, right? The George Washington Bridge had been completed at the end of the 1920s. And the George Washington Bridge was a broad, a regional link in a transportation system. And the way one historian described it, it was like a giant cannon pointed at the Bronx, unleashing a flood of vehicular traffic and with only local roads to circulate in. These were cars, for the most part, that weren't bound for Manhattan or bound, let alone for the Bronx. They were bound for places north. And ever since the 1920s, there had been plans for a highway connector that would channel that regional bridge traffic across the Bronx so those cars could continue on their journey north without bothering the neighborhood. The Regional Plan Association in its 1929 plan had such a proposal. So when Moses came, found a way to access federal highway funds, what he initially did was he lifted up these dormant plans for highways, one of which later was called the Cross Bronx Expressway, and he began building them. And he saw it as completing a project that had been in discussion essentially since the George Washington Bridge was built, and the possibility to build it was awakened by the provision of federal funds. And so he just drew a trajectory essentially across northern Manhattan and the Bronx to direct the bridge traffic 
to the, the highway system. That was the regional highway system that was under construction. But it was not without controversy in terms of its impact on the, on the neighborhoods that it, it went through, right? There was the controversy was huge because, first of all, by that time, there had been so many urban renewal projects and the devastating effects of clearance as a strategy for rebuilding a city were evident. And Moses really had little patience for the criticisms of urban renewal. A key one being that demolition and clearance only aggravated the slum problem because the people who were cleared had no alternative housing to go to, so they were just moving to other slums. But the, so there was tremendous hostility to clearance projects for, for whatever the, the project was, and Moses was the embodiment of clearance as a strategy.